Hi everyone, welcome to the uh, to the Solar Racking Market Series. My name is Erez Dolev and I'm the Managing Director at Renvu. Today we are going to be hearing from Patrick Fleming, Chief Operating Officer at Powerfield Energy, and he will tell us about their unique ground mount ballasted solution for solar arrays. Uh, we will share now in the chat a link to the item page in case you want to uh, look at the documentation and how the product looked like. Uh, before we dive in, and while we're waiting for more people to join, I'll give a little background on Renvu and some of the products and services we offer. Uh, Renvu is a solar equipment distributor. The company was founded in 2012 and based in California. We have three fulfillment centers in California, New Jersey, and Texas, and we, we serve uh, installers and uh, homeowners in the U.S. and in Latin America. Uh, let me go over several products uh, we want to spotlight today. Uh, for energy storage, uh, I'd like to mention our uh, portfolio. We carry Solis and BYD. This is the pair that you see here. Uh, Goodwe with BYD, Growat ESS system, uh, Femur inverters and uh, ESS humless, Iguana AC coupled system, and of course, SolArc and paired with uh, Fortress batteries, Simplify and Humless. Uh, Solis inverters uh, have great residential hybrid and commercial inverters. For commercial inverters, they offer range, uh, a range from 25 kilowatt to uh, 255 kilowatt. And here, what you see is the hybrid inverter that is paired with a BYD power a bank, battery bank. Uh, in this case, in the image, you see you see four 2.5 kilowatt batteries. So this is a total of 10 kilowatt with anywhere between uh, five kilowatt hybrid inverter up to 10 kilowatt. Um, for for microinverters, we carry uh, N phase and AP systems. Here you see the IQ8, which is uh, launching uh, in January. Uh, if you're interested, we have a webinar next week with Enphase to present the IQ8 series, uh, the different options, and uh, probably you will be able to ask questions about availability uh, and access to the product. Uh, we, we estimate that we will have it on the shelf uh, by the end of January but pricing is already available if you want to compare. Uh, at the moment, we carry the IQ7, IQ7 uh, Pluses, IQ7A uh, for, uh, for the different types of installations. Um, SolArc, as I mentioned before, uh, it's our main hybrid uh, all-in-one uh, string inverter. Uh, you can pair it with uh, any lithium battery, low voltage, uh, we carry Fortress Power, uh, Simplify, and Humless uh, to go with it. NLX is a step two EV charger. Uh, we carry the 48 amp uh, option, uh, and we are we are the only ones in the market that carry those. And there are many other uh, options for those for commercial, residential, and uh, high. Uh, high current uh, uh, charging. Uh, for solar panels, uh, specifically to pair with with uh, a power rack, uh, we carry Hyundai 390, 395, and Recom 380s. We also have Q cells, Canadian solar coming in uh, next week, uh, all black 380 and 385 for residential installations. Um, and we're getting some Telson 450s for a bifacial for a commercial installation also coming in uh, this week. Uh, Bleak here is a solar, a residential solar carport. Let me dive in a little bit into this product. Uh, this is a product that uh, is made with galvanized steel with marine grade paint. Uh, so will uh, sustain for 25 years at least. Easy installation designed for both in, uh, installers and DIYers in mind. 
uh, no heavy equipment is required to this uh, for this installation. It's just like a Lego, uh, but very sturdy. Um, the only thing that you need to do in the field is to dig two feet deep uh, uh, piers, fill them with concrete, and then you're just uh, connecting the, the base. Um, the, the surface here can be sealed almost uh, waterproof. It's watertight uh, with uh, EPDM uh, stri uh, strips uh, that can seal the gaps between the panels. Uh, it can carry up to 65 pound per square foot of snow load. Uh, it comes out of the box with 130 mile per hour uh, wind load and can be, uh, can be upgraded up to 175 miles per hour. This is uh, mainly for markets like Florida. Um, and you can purchase only the structure if you want, uh, or you can, you can purchase with modules, inverters, and EV chargers. Uh, the sizes that are available are for two cars and one car. Uh, the span is standard, uh, nine feet per car. So what you see here is 18 feet wide and 18 feet uh, deep. The single uh, single structure, single car structure will be nine feet between the uh, columns. There is another one feet for each side and then you can overhang as well uh, the panels. So you can get a longer, cover, bigger coverage. Uh, the structure comes in, in five uh, degrees tilt, can carry up to 24 60 cell panels, but can also go with, uh, with uh, 18 uh, 72 cells. And there are some accessories that you can add to it, like uh, column lights, which are uh, solar. You don't need to run any wires for this. As I mentioned before, the EPDM a ceiling gasket. There is a mesh, a decorative mesh to hide all the a solar equipment and to give it a little slick a look. And the EV chargers that that have already pre-drilled holes a, on the column to, a, to accept up to two of these a, EV chargers. Uh, there is also authorized installer program that uh, if you want to join, uh, there are many benefits uh, for this. After you are submitting application form and installing three carports, there is a special pricing agreement in place uh, for the uh, carport, but also other equipment like uh, end phase modules and uh, ESS uh, products. And there are benefits like leads and uh, trainings um, that, that you can uh, get if you're a part of this program. I highly recommend it. If, uh, if you want, there will be, uh, we can send you, uh, send you the form to, uh, to fill in. Um, the last thing that I wanted to share is our solar kit guide. It's an online design tool that is available on our homepage. Uh, you can just create a proposal within two minutes with anything you want. You can select what type of inverters, what equipment you want. You're selecting your uh, solar panel. Next step, you're, uh, you will tell which type of roof you have. In this case, we're talking about ground mount. So I'll show here how to design a, a power field uh, system. So you're selecting the number of arrays that uh, that you want to install. And I'll put here two, how many rows per each ray. The first one will be three. Uh, you can select the orientation to be landscape or portrait, but in this case, it doesn't matter uh, because it will it will speed out the same uh, the same bill of material. After you do that, at the bottom, you will have a sketch uh, of the size of the array. Uh, in this case, I didn't put a portrait, so it will not show it, uh, landscape. Um, you can see on the left side, uh, some uh, system summary 
size and also pricing and quantities of the uh, items that are being added to your proposal. You can select if you want a battery backup or not. In this case, I selected battery backup. Um, I don't need for ground mount a rapid shutdown, so I selected no, no monitoring. Uh, it, ask, it asks how many different inverters you want here. If you want to select three different types of inverters, but I want to have only one type, the 10 kilowatt uh, hybrid inverter. So I select one, 10 kilowatt, and I need three here because the system size is a little bit above a 30 kilowatt. Next step, some a balance of system. A, I can add a EV chargers. I can say how many EV chargers I want. And I can add also a permitting package or only line diagram or none. And at the end, I will get a, the full bill of material a, with pricing and quantities. And I can turn it into a proposal and send it to my, uh, to my mailbox by clicking this a, button over there. Uh, while you are a, a logged in to the website, you will see your prices. Otherwise, you will not see prices. Uh, if you have any questions about these products or about Power Rack, please feel free to ask uh, in the Q&A section, and we will uh, we'll get to the questions at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Don't use the chat because it's harder for us to uh, to go through. Uh, you can also email our sales team at info at renvu.com for more information and pricing. Uh, as well, we uh, we do have recordings of previous webinars on the Renvu YouTube channel, which is linked here uh, in the chat at the moment. If you want to take a look at any of our past webinars uh, offerings. Um, all right, it looks like uh, we're about to get started here. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Patrick. There you go. Thank you so much, Erez. I really appreciate the introduction and thank you to you and the entire Renvu team. We really enjoyed our partnership with Renvu uh, over these last this last year uh, and, and so forth. And we're really looking forward to more going forward. And we always enjoy the opportunity to speak to people about our about our product. So thanks for giving us this audience. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to introduce the, the product, of course. I know some of you on this call are, are familiar with PowerField and our Power Rack already and have used our Power Rack. So I don't want to cover too much old ground for you all, but there are some on this call that maybe they're just learning about us now. So I'll certainly introduce the product and go over the basics. I'll be very interested in the questions from those of you that are experienced based on uh, your use in the field. I'm um, interested to know what questions or input you have for us. So we'll, we'll give plenty of time uh, afterwards for, for a Q&A, but I'm gonna share a slide deck here. Okay. So we are PowerField. Uh, you know, our our mission is is pretty simple. We uh, uh, we want to build uh, and provide the world's simplest solar installation system. Uh, that's what we feel that the Power Rack is. Here's my agenda. As I said, I, I just want to introduce the product. Uh, we'll go over some design considerations, um, permitting support, and what we can provide uh, to permitting packages and HJ reviews, and then uh, go over some best practices about how the product is installed and how power rack arrays are, are put up in the field. And then again, leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, this is the power rack. Um, this is our simple solution to solar PV racking. Uh, th the goal of our co-founder several years ago, quite simply, was to reduce project cost. I mean, that's really what it's all about. Um, and, and in this case, we reduce project costs by building a racking system that is fast and easy to install. Uh, the Power Rack doesn't require any assembly whatsoever. It's a single piece uh, design. No tools are required uh, to put it 
in. There's no digging. It's a pure surface mount ballasted system. So there's no digging, no pile driving. Uh, there's no steel, no concrete. It uh, doesn't take any special skills <clears throat> and no unique equipment to put it in. Uh, some of the added benefits of the power rack is it creates a very low profile design. It sits relatively low to the ground. So it's a it's an aesthetically pleasing uh, array. It doesn't block any views or sight lines. Uh, it's a it's very robust. It's designed to be permanent. It's designed to sit out uh, in the field just like any other installation um, <clears throat> for you know 25 years or more. But because it's so easy and it's a, and it's a ballasted surface mount system, it's also portable. It's it just as easy to take down as it is to put up. Um, <clears throat> it opens up site flexibility options. You can put up a ballasted system on some uh, some areas that you can't otherwise do solar. Uh, and it creates a, an opportunity to repurpose the land in the future. Uh, if you want to pack this system up and move it, uh, that can be done um, with relative ease compared compared to other systems. The product is is made out of a, a high recycled content uh, um, HDPE material, and which is itself recyclable. So it, it's a it's a pretty sustainable product in and of itself. Uh, and if you're using natural ballasty material, which which you're almost always going to be using, then you've got some additional sustainability there. Har you know, reharvesting some some loose aggregate from the site itself, or bringing in even from the outside any natural material that can be, be repurposed uh, or reused later on down the road. And uh, our product is is fully made in the USA. I'm going to jump right to uh, the mounting. I'm going to move backwards a little bit um, through the installation process. These are close-up views of the top edge on the left and the bottom edge on the right of the of the rack. And I zoomed in here just to show that the it's a single piece product. It's engineered to integrate the mounting into uh, the rack itself. So this is the top edge. Uh, no additional pieces whatsoever required up here. You can see, uh, if I can create my little pointer. That <clears throat> there is a slot built into the top edge of the rack here and the, the, the panel, the module frame slides right into that slot on the top edge. Uh, this, this is my uh, little fake module frame here. Uh, that slides right down into this edge. And what I did earlier this morning, which unfortunately is not going to work, is I embedded a little video showing how easy that is. And then these videos did not embed. So this is a still shot of a five second video of uh, Paul and David here just sliding that panel right into that top edge. So um, the, the intent was just, just to show how simple it is. Uh, but you can just imagine that module sets right down on the the top tabs of the rack and slides right into place. Takes a couple of seconds. On the bottom edge, the only additional components are two clips pieces uh, that grasp the module frame from underneath. So once the once the module is resting along this bottom ledge of the rack, then there are two clips, two identical clips that slide into their place here and then up and grasp the module frame from underneath. So again, you have a module, that, that lower module frame resting there. These, these two tines of the retainer clip are just sliding up under and then grasping that frame from underneath. Uh, and that's all done by hand. Again, a non-existent video here uh, showing that it just takes a couple of seconds. This is three seconds of Adam sliding one of those retainer clips into place. So once the racks are placed and ballasted, attaching the, the modules is really the quickest part of the whole thing. It, the, it slides right into place um, and then you're connecting cables and doing your bonding and you're, you're on your way. Um, considerations in design, it's because it's a fixed rigid product, the pitch is built in. It's a 25 degree pitch. Uh, it is that is not adjustable because it's a one piece design. We we chose 25 degrees because that's optimal uh, across large swaths of uh, of the U.S. Uh, and then of course plus or minus any 
any inclination you have in the underlying slope. So, uh, you know, plenty of our customers are putting these arrays on ground that already has a slope of some kind. So, of course, that's going to add or subtract to the 25 degree pitch of the of the rack itself. Uh, the arrays are always single row landscape orientation. Uh, and you can see here uh, this sort of a, that aesthetic benefit I was talking about. You're, you're building a, a very low profile array that doesn't block your view of your lake there on the left or your view out your windows there in the middle. Um, <clears throat> the consideration on row spacing, we always say about three feet or about a meter. That's about, about the width of an additional module there in the middle. The, the, there's really not much shading because you're sitting so low to the ground. Uh, site maintenance um, is really one of the, the primary considerations. On, on the left, that's a tiny picture, but you can see some folks put these arrays down on a bed of gravel with a, with a, with a barrier uh, to control vegetation on the right that, that is not happening over here. And so you just want enough space in between the row to mow or weed eat or spray or whatever you want to do to control vegetation there. Um, but again, shading and, and, and maintenance are the only two real factors when it comes to um, row separation. And you shouldn't ever really need much more than three feet or, or a meter. Uh, there, uh, there, are several, yeah. there are several related questions maybe uh, that you might want to respond to. One is, uh, what is the leading edge height? And what about snow uh, accumulation in the front edge? edge? Okay, very good. Yeah, thanks, Erez. So uh, that, that leading edge, that lower edge, is eight inches off the ground. So not, not very high. And it's going to be 25 to a little more than 25 inches uh, at the top edge. And snow, uh, snow accumulation, there, there's a very high snow loading factor. So it's not loading is not... Um, an issue really. Snow would accumulate being that low to the ground. Certainly if you're in a snowy area, uh, that's something to think about. We, we've sold plenty of systems to snowy areas, um, primarily smaller residential systems where that user is going to blow the snow or perhaps sweep the snow uh, as necessary. And for them, the payoff of uh, reducing sight line, reducing um, the, the interference with sight lines is is a big factor. Uh, some of those systems are in areas where they, their views are precious to them. And so they'll take a little bit of accumulation or a little bit more maintenance to reduce that accumulation in exchange for keeping that array down low uh, out, out of their view. Um, <clears throat> so that, yeah, that would be a, that would be a factor for sure. Uh, that's something for you to think about. Uh, the, because the the mounting mechanism really is is a slot, uh, you know, the rack can be positioned really anywhere under that module. And what that does is open up some flexibility for how many racks uh, and where they need to be placed underneath the modules. I want to go over the two two sort of most basic layout options here. On the left side, that's two power racks underneath an individual module. And there are a couple reasons why that's advantageous. On the one hand, uh, I'm going to go over wind speed tolerance and ballasting requirements here in a few minutes. But obviously, if you have two full power racks under a module, that allows you uh, more ballast weight under a given module and throughout the array. And so that'll withstand a higher wind speed tolerance if you're using two per. Uh, the other advantage is uh, that frees up the modules. The modules are not permanently affixed to each other in that layout, and therefore the module, the, the array can tolerate a little more undulation or a little more imperfection in the underlying ground service surface. On the right, you see where um, that, that rack that's half exposed is waiting for the next module to be placed. So the, the rack can be placed where the two modules come together, we call that a rack sharing layout. That reduces your overall rack count because you just have one rack at each panel joint. Uh, and as, as long as you, you know, your array is, is holding sufficient ballast weight, that's, that works really well. 
But you can also see looking down that road that those modules are in perfect plane with each other because they're meeting inside of those slots uh, on top of the rack. And so this being a pure surface mount, if you need the panels to be in perfect plane, then the ground underneath needs to be in near perfect plane. Uh, if any of those racks are sitting in a divot or up on a mound, it would be difficult to, to bring those panels together perfectly uh, on top of a single rack. So you have to put a little bit more energy and, and perhaps cost into site improvement uh, with that layout. And so there's an exchange there between site improvement cost and, and overall rack count and therefore rack cost. Uh, and we have plenty of customers do it both ways uh, and it works really well well in either case uh, getting to grounding and bonding here real quick um, you know you've got your traditional options you can use uh, copper and grounding lugs along the module frames the product of course being HDPE is not providing any conductive effect so that the, the power racks themselves are not part of the, the bonding or grounding solution the, on the other uh, the other option here we we have used ourselves plenty of times and we've recommended to customers the use of these DynaBond uh, grounding jumpers made by DynaRacks. Uh, and they're a, they're, it's a one piece product there that, that pushes onto the panel frames and creates a, a bonding jumper uh, frame to frame uh, down the row. And then at the end of that row, you're either gonna use copper and a grounding rod or Dino, DynaBonds actually are, are UL uh, approved to be the 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 grounding solution at the end of the row as well down into a um uh, sorry down into the housing um uh, of the conduit sorry and ground ground that way uh so those are your options there for bonding um getting into permitting here so <clears throat> the, the primary factor of course is wind speed tolerance and we've, we've done extensive wind engineering to include wind tunnel testing. And what we have is a, is a calculator that takes as inputs the wind speed requirement, the exposure category, and the particular layout of the, of the, of the array. And then the calculator generates the, the, the specific weights uh, in pounds that each rack in the array needs to hold in order to secure that array against those wind speed requirements. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the process of, of making that calculator uh, user-friendly and self-service, and that way it'll be up online for customers to use themselves, and we'll also be able to integrate that into design tools such as Rendo's uh, that Erez was showing to you. At the moment, that's, it's not ready for that kind of integration, so we do those calculations ourselves and produce a ballast weight diagram for for every customer as part of their permitting package. Um, and you can see in this slide, this is just one ex example of how that ballast weight diagram will look. Uh, this is cut from a, a recent permitting package. This particular array was two long rows and one little stub row there at the, at the top. And the, the different colors and the key along the bottom just illustrate that uh, the calculator will vary the weight accordingly. There's there's almost always going to be more weight required in the out, along the outer edges and the the topmost row and at the corners. So you can see that here, and then you can get away with less weight on the interior modules and the downwind rows. the The easiest thing always would be simply to fill up every rack completely full and you'd be very secure. But if you wanna be efficient with your ballast material, then this diagram will, will help you do that. Uh, we, we can provide additional permitting support. We can, we can do engineering ourselves. Uh, there are plenty of tools like, like Renvu's uh, or you may have your own electrician doing this, uh, but we can outsource it. We've, there are firms that we've used before. These, these packages here happen to be have done uh, by a firm called Aztec that knows our pr product really well uh, and can turn these around relatively quickly. But uh, we've um, we've never been turned down um, from permitting. We've been approved and and uh, authorized every everywhere we've ever applied. Um, so we'll provide whatever support we need uh, to to see that that's done. So finishing up here on on how installation works. Uh, 
you know, the mounting the module um, is really the simplest part of it. Um, so getting into just placing the racks, aligning the racks, and then ballasting them. Uh, there are some tricks of the trade that we've been learning uh, in the field over the last couple of years. We, our installation manual doesn't specify in particular these tricks um, because a lot of them have been sort of figured out in the field by customers. Uh, we're going to uh, update our manual uh, as we go with, with some of these best practices just to, you know, get people um, a little bit further down the road with, with some of these suggestions. Uh, but what you see on the left there is a simple measuring tape, uh, measuring out the, the row and setting the racks in place prior to ballasting. What you see on the right, uh, we've this is this is a recent development. We've had some some customers recently build in the field a little jig or a guide that they use to to set uh, each pair of power racks in place prior to ballasting. As you can imagine, the, the ballasting itself can knock these racks out of alignment relatively easy. The, an empty power rack is only 15 pounds. So shoveling or, or throwing some, some ballast material in there mechanically uh, is gonna knock these uh, racks out of alignment without too much trouble. So a, a jig or a tool like this is very helpful for holding those power racks in place while they're being ballasted so that they're right where they need to be when it comes time to putting the, the modules on. And you know, the reason we don't build and supply these jigs ourselves is simply that, you know, as you can imagine, the, the particular measurements are unique to each project according to which modules you're using, uh, your row spacing and things like that. Um, so that, uh, the, you know, this is one example of one that was thrown together in the field uh, once they knew their module dimensions and all their uh, spacing, they just put this together and then they move that down the row uh, and ballast with that in place so that those racks are, uh, are right where they need to be. Uh, another way to go about that, and as opposed to that full frame jig, um, this we had another customer do this recently where they, on the left there, uh, used used two by fours or, or um, boards, and then we've got holes on those top uh, tabs already. Those holes are pre-existing, and they bolted, they measured, and then bolted uh, through those holes to set those lock those racks in place as they were being ballasted. That that feels like a little bit uh, of a hassle to me. So I think an another option and we're, we're, we're going to do our own project here shortly and I'm excited to use um, uh, you know use use a metal piece like we've got here on the right um, you know that are available anywhere and then affixing bolts in in the in the right holes once they've measured and then just lifting and moving that piece as its own little jig uh, down the row matching each pair of power racks in place uh, while they're ballasted so that they uh, don't get knocked out of alignment. So those are those are just a couple of, um, you know, lessons learned and, and handy hints when it comes to, to placing the racks and, and making sure they stay in place. The actual ballasting, you can do it the old fashioned way. This is me on the left uh, a little while ago helping a customer out in Colorado uh, ballast the old fashioned way with shovels. Uh, that works well enough for relatively small projects. You wouldn't want to do that. Um, for very big arrays. So there are plenty of mechanized options on the left. That's a side discharge bucket on a skid steer. It just drives drives down the row and, and spits uh, ballast out the side into each rack. That gentleman there, uh, again, without the jig, he's just holding that rack in place. He's got his foot there bracing it so that, that the violence of that ballasting is not knocking that, that rack out of place. And then on the right, we haven't used this uh, tool yet, but we've got uh, three, I think, project plans that are in the works now using this solution. This is called a slinger truck. I'm pretty excited about getting it out uh, for the first time. It's a re this one is a remote operated slinger truck. So it's a one man operation, uh, pretty heavy duty piece of equipment. So you'd wanna make sure your site can handle it. But that conveyor on the back there is long enough and articulates and is high enough to reach across multiple rows. So you could lay, you could set three rows of racks 
and then have that truck pass down pass down that row three times and fill uh fill that those three rows of of power racks and then as those modules are being placed you've got a crew setting out the next three rows of power racks while that truck is going to refill if necessary and then coming back and, th and that operator on a contract basis that's a single operator with a single single piece of equipment doing your entire ballasting operation um, and that those conveyors even better are uh, variable speed so they're dropping that ballast much more gently into those racks than uh, than that side discharge bucket on the left is. So plenty of mechanized options for making that a much uh, much easier on your back, the ballasting. So that's all the time I wanted to spend on overviewing the product and, and kind of getting into some of the design considerations and installation. I want to leave lots of time here for you all to ask questions, um, and I'm happy to get into any any details you'd like to get into. So let's have at it. Okay. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, I'll jump into the Q and A. If anybody have questions, throw it there, not in the chat. I will I will check the chat in a second, but uh, it will be much easier to go through the Q and A. Um, so Eli is asking, what is the, uh, the GCR, the ground coverage ra uh, ratio? I'm sorry, uh, Erez, you broke up for a second. What was that question? Uh, what is what is the GCR, the ground coverage ratio? Okay, so again, yeah, you've got um, your single row landscape orientation, and then the, it's it's best to, uh, for estimation purposes, just imagine that there's a second row of modules separating, you know, each row. So an, another meter worth. So you have a single row of, um, of modules occupying uh, sort of twice that width worth of space. So I, I can't remember how the math works out on that, but you've got um, your exposed space is the equivalent of each of each individual row. Okay, uh, and that takes into that was pretty. That was Pretty pretty clumsy there, but um, I mean, does does it take into account also the uh, the inter row spacing or the space? Uh, uh, well, I'm not sure what you mean by does it take into consideration the inter row spacing? The GCR that you that you mentioned. I assume that this is. The question was about the whole array rather than just one row, right? Um, let's let's right. jump. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Let's jump to the next question. Uh, Eli asking here also: Can you install on a flat roof? No. So we 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 our product is designed specifically for the ground. Uh, it, its attributes really theoretically would work would work really well on a on a flat roof just like other ballasted systems do but the but but the pitch that 25 degree pitch and the overall size of the rack really make it too heavy of a solution for most roofs i mean you'd end up with too much ballast material because 25 degrees requires so much more ballast than a typical rooftop which is 10 or 15 degree inclination, uh, you're going to end up with with a much higher pounds per square inch um, factor than you would probably want on most commercial roofs. We will have a rooftop product in the future that's in design right now. We started with this ground mount uh, product and we're working on our rooftop uh, iteration probably be out later next year. Sounds good. Uh, do you have any engineering data uh, attesting to the longevity of your plastic mounting parts over 25 years of extreme UV exposure in areas like the high desert region, regions in southern uh, U.S.? We don't have any specific data to our, to our product. We have not done uh, rigorous accelerated life cycle testing yet to, to, to collect that data, but we purposefully chose a material 
uh, that is widely used in lots of other products that have long life cycles out in harsh conditions. For example, uh, in the early days, we always looked at the, the, the feeding trough um, as a, an example. So we use similar material that uh, is in feeding troughs on farms uh, or other pieces of equipment, tubs, containers, tanks. Uh, they're made out of this same material and they, they are sitting out in the open um, in harsh conditions for forever, uh, uh, essentially forever. Uh, and, and then our, our product in addition is protected by the fact that the module is on top of it. So even with that, uh, our product, uh, you know, has the benefit of, of uh, not being um, under harsh UV really for any length of time. Only small pieces of it are getting the sun's direct, uh, direct rays. So we we we'll, we don't have that data yet, but we're we're as confident as we could be in the in the life cycle durability of this product. Uh, talking about uh, panels covering the uh, the racks, uh, there is a question here about about water. So are there drain holes in case water gets into the into the rack? Yes, and uh, on the bottom of the rack there are there are are actually five holes. Four of them are specifically for moisture management. Uh, not much precipitation gets in there because again, the, the module is on top and the, 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 the fit uh, in those uh, mounting slots is a pretty tight tolerance. So there's not a lot of room, uh, but there is, a, there is a cavity up underneath the glass there. Uh, and so wind or, or, or just condensation could easily allow some moisture to get in there. So for that reason, um, and for, of course, freezing, thawing, et cetera, there are some holes in the bottom to allow moisture uh, to, to, to drain out. And then there's a fifth hole that's designed, that helps with that as well, but it's designed specifically for the use of ground anchors. If ground anchors are necessary to augment uh, the structure, uh, then there's a, there's a hole in the bottom in the center uh, for that purpose as well. Sounds good. Um, okay, there is a Robert. Robert is asking what field height is needed per ballast weight, or what volume per height of ballast. Uh, that's good. Thank you. So our our um, ballast weight calculator helps with those figures, and we've got a section of our installation manual that goes over that as well, and it has a a diagram that shows. Uh, for example, what different heights of ballast material inside of the rack equate to in terms of weights. You know, that'll vary a little bit by what material you're using. So if you need to be, if, you, if you're required to be super precise, then it's always a good idea to, to test, uh, you know, a single power rack with your, your specific material um, and weigh what different levels uh, come out to be. There are visual indicators inside of the rack. We, we put um, our mold placed a few uh, indicator lines on the inside of each power rack. So if you're doing that weighing uh, to be precise or even just as a rule of thumb as you go, there are visual indicators that you can match uh, as you go. You'll, you'll know, for example, that if you fill to the third line, you know, it's 350 pounds or, or, or what have you. But as a rule of thumb, filled all the way to the brim, uh, each power rack can hold up to 550 pounds. Uh, again, they're 15 pounds empty, but filled all the way up there, 550 pounds. So you can get a good amount of variability in there. Thank you. Okay. Robert is also asking, is the whip hole present in the bottom for drainage? And I feel that you answered that before and mentioned that one hole is for anchoring, right? And the rest is for drainage. Yeah, there, there are five holes. And of course, they'd all, they would all be helpful for moisture management. But, the, but the, the one in the center is a little bit bigger and it's round uh, specifically for a ground anchor if that should be necessary. OK. Uh, Eddie is asking, how do you use this system on a landfill or a cupped area of land? taking into consideration limited ground uh, disturbance. Uh, that's right. So it, you know, as a, as a pure surface mount ballasted system, it works really well. 
on sites that that can't handle any kind of penetration so there's there's no penetration and and um that you know that 550 pounds if you're fully ballasting feels like a lot but it's a broad uh the bottom of the power rack is a broad surface so it, it it's a very tolerable um pounds per square foot factor so it's not too much weight for any of those protected areas uh, brownfield are very good candidates uh, for power racks um <clears throat> You know, some of those sites would be ones where you might have to be a little careful about driving out, you know, one of those big pieces of equipment for the ballasting. But so long as you can get uh, you, your ballasting equipment out there, uh, which, you know, maybe if you wanted to be, if you needed a lighter footprint, then in that case, you're using a skid steer instead of a big dump truck. Uh, but that's going to be your your biggest concern is, is the ballasting equipment, not the not the racks themselves or the arrays. Sounds good. A uh, Robert is asking about a more universal, a more universal module width. Uh, if you have, if you have plans to uh, to extend that range. Yes, absolutely. So we're we're in design right now on our next sizes. Uh, again, you know, it's a, each rack is a fixed fixed product so that it's not adjustable for size. There is some range. Uh, we, we specifically engineered that bottom ledge that I showed you earlier to have a, a tolerance of about 40 millimeters. So the, the current range um, is about 970 millimeters to 1010 millimeters in width. And again, because they're landscape orientation, we're talking about the width of the module and then our next size will will go upwards from uh, 1,010 to about 1,050 millimeters, and then we'll have a third size that'll start getting at the the truly large format uh, modules that are you know becoming more popular now. So uh, we do have to retool and 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 build a new mold for that. Um, and we and to do that we we have to. We have to go back and do some more wind engineering and wind testing because if, once we change the size and the profile and with a bigger module, then you know it'll adjust our uh, wind wind speed and ballast weight calculator. And so uh, that that's what we're doing now, and uh, we expect to have those next sizes coming out uh, second quarter, hopefully, possibly third quarter of of next year. Great. Uh so that answered multiple questions here. Um, Robert is asking, does HDPE have any deformation issues at temperature in desert areas? Yeah, not not uh, negligible, I'll say. So they're they're not non-existent, um, but we you know we certainly designed and we choose our material with that in mind. Um, so we've we've chosen a material and designed the the thicknesses and the dimensions of the of the product. Uh, to make to take that out of the equation, so uh, we spent a lot of time in our design and development period looking at that and making sure that you know these racks weren't going to uh, over time deform in a way that either stressed a module frame or or weakened the connection. And so we've uh, we feel really good about the product now. And again, even in the really hot climates, you know there. Um, they're protected somewhat by the shade of the module themselves. So we, we're in, uh, we've got arrays up in, in some of those hot climates and we haven't seen any uh, any problems and we don't anticipate there being any problems with that issue. Sounds good. Uh, Philip is asking to talk about MLPE attachment. So end phase IQ7 or AP systems or... Yes. Yes, so that all of those kinds of components, optimizers and and uh, microinverters work just fine. Uh, you are mounting those using the brackets on the module frames themselves. Uh, we we have had customers ask about drilling or mounting those components directly onto the power rack, and I, and I would say that's entirely uh, possible. It's a very again, it's a very robust. Uh, material and the, the thicknesses of the walls of our power rack could certainly withstand that. But uh, because the integrity of the power rack is a factor of the ballast weight, which goes into our, our ballast weight calculator and wind engineering, that's that's not something we would 
um, you know, be able to stand by from a from sort of a liability uh, perspective. Um, but if you if you were using screws to mount those components directly onto the power rack, uh, I will tell you, you're not, not going to break the power rack. Um, but we're we're not specifically designing these products for that. Uh, what we what we recommend instead is that you mount them uh, using the brackets on the module frames themselves. And we and we've and that's been done. Also, we have customers that have done that. Sounds good. Uh, Richard is asking here, uh, is there a way to add power rack to your system analysis? And this is, uh, that's what I showed before. The solar kit guide uh, already has the power rack uh, in there. So all you need to do is select, go through the uh, solar kit guide on our uh, homepage and select ground mount and then scroll down and select power field that will enable you to, uh, to design a, a ground mount ballasted uh, system. And, and there are other options too uh, for other products if you want to compare and you will see that the pricing here uh, is an advantage of uh, the power rack. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, someone is asking here, can you get this permitted on a leach field? I realize that it may vary according to the AHA, but uh, have you had any projects approved on a leach field? Um, <clears throat> I can't think of a specific project. We, we've had, I just was speaking to someone actually this week uh, a big commercial installer who has a contract to do multiple leach fields and they're looking at using the power rack. So that that's still in development. I don't believe they've received approval yet. Um, I can't say whether or not someone has bought our power racks and used them on that application without me necessarily knowing it. Uh, but I can't think of a specific project that I've that we've been involved with directly on a leach field but I, I don't see why it wouldn't I can't can't think of a reason why it yeah. could yeah. not work there um, Elroy is asking uh, about portrait orientation mounting and I assume that the width here is an issue that's right so the because the 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 rack being a fixed size and it needs to be in contact, uh, with the top and bottom of the module frame itself, a portrait orientation would require a power rack to be too tall. Uh, and so that the reason we go with landscape uh, is so that we're grasping the width dimension instead of the length dimension of the, of the module. And uh, Salvador uh, is asking here, what's the solution for row to row wiring? Uh, so oftentimes that's trenching, uh, trenching with conduit, uh, depending on what your local um, requirements are, uh, it is possible to, to do cabling and wiring above ground, either conduit along the top of the ground or sometimes elevated uh, using uh, guy wires or, or um, stanchions, et cetera. Uh, that that's really a factor of what's allowable um, locally according to code. Okay. Um, and the last question is a what is the RTI rating? Uh, what would RTI be? Um, let me see. I think it's the fire rating or flame. Um, RTI rating for plastic. I think it's it's just a withstanding fire. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe that questioner could send us a follow up directly, and we'll follow okay. up directly with them once we know what that what specifically they're referring to. Sounds good. Um, and 
Dale is asking about uh, shipping, stacking, and weight freight. Oh yes, great. Yeah, thank you. Great question. We uh, we manufacture the product in Ohio, so it relatively centrally located, and it it uh, it it's designed to nest and stack easily. So they the uh, power racks are shipped palletized at forty units per pallet, uh, and that pallet is six hundred pounds. Um, once once those two stacks of 20 are on there. And so they, um, they're they shipped that way and that makes them you know, pretty easy to, to unload and maneuver on site. Sounds good. Um, let me go over the chat real quick to see if I missed anything. Uh, for pricing, uh, you can just go on our website, use our uh, estimate tool, the solar kit guide on our front page, you will get a full uh, full uh, pricing for this. Uh, and on our website- okay, And let me, on that note, Erez, let me, let me just follow up real quick on that. So you'll see that our pricing is based on, on, on units. So we will price, we'll say that uh, our price is, you know, per power rack unit. As I described earlier, the number of units required for your project could vary. So that's why we don't have a, a consistent cents per watt cost listed. We, we, um, we price them per unit for that reason because of that variability. So if you, as you get into thinking about your project and how many racks you might need, you know, let us know and we'll be happy to help you with that exploration. You can always start with two racks per module. That'll be your your upper end. Uh, and then if you can get away with rack sharing, as I described, then it's going to come down from there. Sounds good. Uh, it looks like we are almost at 11. Uh, so we will wrap up here. If anybody have more questions or, uh, or uh, want to discuss pricing and design uh, with us, uh, you, can, you can write an email to info at renvu.com or give us a call and we'll be happy to follow a uh, follow up after the webinar. Uh, we will send you all the recording of this webinar and an email with some, uh, some offers that are related. And thank you very much, Patrick and, and Powerfield team. It was great again to have you. Yeah, thank you, Erez. Really appreciate the opportunity. And thanks for all the attend attendees. It was great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hope to hear from you soon.